Hi, I'm Rose Laval. I own Morning Sun Herb Farm, a small specialty nursery in Northern California. Welcome to our herb video series. Last week we discussed basils, all about basils, from the regular varieties that we're all used to growing to some new, beautiful, and interesting varieties. We discussed how to grow them, how to harvest them. We're going to look at that bed in about four weeks to compare our growth pattern and see how quickly basils can grow. This week, we're going to discuss the five essential culinary herbs that every garden should include. These herbs are going to be not just what you're used to growing, but maybe some interesting variations that you can include not just in your kitchen, but maybe in your bath water or even as your adult libation. So be sure to watch. The first herb we're going to discuss today is parsley. You know that old song, Scarborough Fair? parsley, sage, rosemary, and thyme, well those are four of the five essential herbs we're going to talk about today. Let's go look at our first essential herb, parsley. One of our most common herbs that we grow is parsley. And parsley tends to be that herb that sits on the edge of our plate and we don't think about using it for cooking or any important thing in our life, but it's actually a really important herb. Parsley is Petrosilinium crispum. This is Italian flat leaf parsley, and this is curly parsley. Italian flat leaf parsley is the more commonly used parsley. It's also the sturdier parsley. So if you are growing this in a colder climate during the winter, flat leaf parsley is the better one for winter growing. Curly leaf parsley is more beautiful looking, so it really does make a nice garnish on the plate. Parsley is a biennial. Many of the herbs we talk about are perennial, meaning they live from year to year. Parsley grows one year, puts on seed the next spring, and then the original plant dies. So you're going to be replanting your parsley every year. A little history about parsley. Parsley was used back by the Romans and Greeks as a breath freshener. So interestingly, the Romans used it as part of their orgy uh, to hide the fragrance and the smell of alcohol in their breath. So that's just a little history for you about parsley. Parsley was also used a lot in funerals. So it actually helps uh, as a fumigant. So it was used both the seed of parsley and the leaves of parsley were put on corpses to help deodorize the bodies. We don't need to use that for that now, but we can actually use this as a really important green. Parsley is a vitamin capsule in a leaf. So parsley is super high in vitamin A, vitamin C, vitamin B6 and 12, chlorophyll. It's just a fabulous plant to include in your cooking. It's not just to be used as an accompaniment on the side of the plate. Italian parsley is used a lot for cooking. So if you're going to actually be heating it up, again in like a sauce or something like that, the flat leaf parsley is the way to go. Curly parsley is better fresh because it loses the flavor very quickly. Also, we tend to use it fresh, not dried. Dried parsley is like dried lawn. It doesn't taste like anything. So use your parsley fresh. Plant it a couple times during the year. Plant one in the spring, one in the fall. So you always have a fresh parsley going. Like basil, you want to water it and fertilize it a lot more. So these little plants in this size pot, these are little three inch pots, these get fertilized at least twice a week. If you're in a larger container, you would fertilize it once every two weeks. And in the ground, we fertilize it once a month. Very different than our perennial herbs. But an important herb to include in our garden. Finally, one really great point about parsley. Many years ago, a customer bought a little container of parsley, walked it all the way up, got in their car, came back in a huff and said, there is a worm on my parsley. And so one of my employees looked at it and she said, oh, that's not a worm. That is the caterpillar from one of our favorite butterflies, the swallowtail butterfly. And the customer grabbed the pot back and said, I bought that caterpillar. Immediately, that little worm went from being an insect that was gonna completely eat that plant to the ground and, hor and was horrible to an insect that was gonna completely eat that 
poor little herb to the ground, but was a fabulous pollinator to have in the garden. So even if you don't eat this, you want to include this in your pollinator garden because in leaf form, it's good for caterpillars. And when it's blooming, it's good for our adult pollinators to eat both butterflies and a lot of our native uh, bees as well. So include parsley in your garden, whether you have it in a container, on a windowsill, or in a raised bed, or out in your garden beds. It's a great herb to include. The second essential herb for your herb garden is sage. Our common culinary sage, Salvia officinalis. Here is one of the beautiful flowers from our traditional garden sage. Lovely flower that, I'm gonna pluck one off, and I'm gonna eat it. Because as we mentioned with the basils, if you can eat the leaves, you can eat the flowers. And sage makes a wonderful kind of sweet, well-rounded tasting flower. There are 750 species of salvia. We're only gonna discuss one species today, and that's salvia officinalis. Even within that species, we have lots of variability. So I have four little specimens here. Our largest one is our common seed-grown salvia officinalis with the big green leaf. It gets about two feet tall when it's full grown. Easy to grow, but it likes good drainage. So the thing we find about this plant is you'll notice we're, I'm kind of up at the top end of our little garden space here. It wants drainage. So it's up at the top, all the water has to drain away, whether it's summertime or more importantly, wintertime when we tend to get standing water in our gardens. Some of our other beautiful culinary sages though, this is a small one called Nazareth. Very small leaf and a very small plant. It only gets 10 to 12 inches tall. It still puts on that beautiful purple flower. It's excellent for a container because again, it's only maybe 10 inches by 10 inches. Very strong flavor with a smaller leaf. One of the lovely components about Salvia officinalis is that you can also grow it as a bedding plant or as an edging plant in your garden. I have two examples here. I have tricolor sage, three colors to that foliage. It's just lovely. It doesn't tend to bloom as much, but it makes up for it in having that three colors to the leaf. We also have this beautiful purple sage where the foliage has this nice kind of purple maroon look to it. it still has that green leaf. It does put on a little pink flower, but again, not too, not too showy, not like our regular garden sage. It only gets about a foot tall, but in a container at the front of an edge of a bed, it just looks really beautiful. They all have really good flavor, so any of these can be used for your cooking. Now, Salvia officinalis is one of those sages that has a long history, thousands of years. It has been used um, for many different purposes, and one of the things is that sage is the herb of wisdom and immortality. So if anyone has ever wanted to offer you some sage advice, there's a reason for that. They want to uh, give you some very wise advice. Sage is planted in the garden um, where men rule the house. So if you have a big sturdy sage plant, the Druids believed that men ruled the house in that case. Our sage plants look pretty good, but our dogs squish them down quite a bit and if they sit in too much water, they are very short-lived. Sage is one of those plants that people tend to only use for cooking at Thanksgiving, and I'm not sure why that is. We mix a half a cup of sage with a cup and a half of the Italian parsley leaves. We add a little bit of either walnuts, or um, you can use any sort of a nut actually, and about a half a cup of olive oil, a little bit of Parmesan cheese. You can see where I'm going with this little recipe. And you end up with a sage pesto. And for summer cooking, especially if you're making zucchini or a little tapa that has maybe eggplant in it, it's wonderful. So a summer pesto with sage. Again, it doesn't have to just be for Thanksgiving. These large leaves are also the ones that we flash fry. So if you're doing a brown butter pasta, this is the one you would quick fry, and you have this beautiful, crispy, crunchy sage leaf. 
Uh, all the little bit of bitterness is gone from it when you do that. It's wonderful for cooking. So an easy one for, um, for using for cooking. Medicinally, it's used historically as an antibiotic, um, antibacterial, antiseptic. It's great for cleansing wounds also. It grows in full sun, preferably. You can see here we've got it in a full sun bed. Um, it's native to the Mediterranean. So we're not talking about your California native sages here. We're talking about sages that are native to the Mediterranean. You'll get a very different flavor from California native sages and probably not one you're accustomed to or are going to appreciate. So use Salvia officinalis in all of its color forms in your garden and for your cooking. Our third essential herb for the garden bed is rosemary, Rosemarinus officinalis. There's only one species of rosemary, so most people go, good, there's only one species, that's an easy one. However, rosemary grows from a low growing ground cover that only gets six inches tall to rosemaries that grow as tall as eight feet. So there's many different varieties to choose from and I wanna really focus on a couple today. So rosemary officinalis, has an ancient and long history. Here's a beautiful plant of it, and you notice it has kind of a very slender leaf, almost like a needle-like leaf. Rosemarinus, the genus name, means uh, Mary of the Sea. It's a very ancient plant with a lot of great history behind it. And if you read any Shakespeare, one of the things you remember is, there's rosemary, that's for remembrance. So rosemary is the plant of remembrance. It's the herb of remembrance. You'll see it in bouquets for funerals, bouquets for weddings, bouquets for birthdays, um, all kinds of memories. And interestingly, rosemary tends to uh, assist with blood flow, blood circulation. So it's one of those herbs that you use as a crown, um, as a garland around your head to help you remember and help uh, blood circulation. So a lot of great old history. The Druids believed that if rosemary grew well in your garden, the woman ruled the house. So rosemary is definitely a woman's herb. We think of rosemary, of course, as a common culinary. And if you're here in California, it's also one of those herbs that's almost a weed. It grows everywhere. Every parking lot has a rosemary. You can literally run over the top of it on your way to get a coffee. So it's just sort of crazy. However, in most parts of the country, it's actually not winter hardy and people bring it inside during the winter. So you choose your smaller varieties, of course, in order to keep it small and in a container. The variety I'm standing in front of right here is called Golden Rain. And I wanna cut off a branch of this. When people look at it, they either think that it's beautiful or sometimes they think that there's something wrong with it because it has some yellow in the leaves. It has this mottled variegation, variegation meaning a leaf that's more than one color, generally green and yellow or green and white. And this particular variety is super high in essential oil. When I touch this new foliage, my fingers are actually sticky. Oh my gosh, it smells so good. I think potatoes immediately when I think of uh, when I smell this rosemary. So this particular variety is not um, a well-known variety, but we love to use it for cooking because the flavor is clean with no bitterness. Um, just a wonderful fresh rosemary flavor. It only gets about two feet tall and it has that beautiful little variegation. So it always looks really attractive. Nice little plant that works in a container or a small bed also. So a lesser known variety but really great for using for cooking. There are a lot of other varieties though. I have one here on the edge of my garden. This is a semi-trailing rosemary called Ken Taylor. So again, there's only one species of rosemary, but there's a whole bunch of varieties. And this is showing this beautiful purple flower that we get in March and April here in California. These are great for bringing in your early bees. So bees really love rosemary. Again, that flower is edible, very delicious. Most rosemaries you're going to see have either a purple or blue flower. So a little more history about rosemary. I mentioned 
it's a women's herb, it's also the Virgin Mary's herb. So it was believed that the flowers of rosemary were always white. And then the Virgin Mary placed her cloak on top of a rosemary plant one day, and when she pulled it off, all the flowers were blue, which of course is the Virgin Mary's color. And so from that, all of the rosemaries tend to have that dark purple flower. It's an easy plant to grow. Generally, we think of rosemary as growing in full sun. And that's true, but remember, herbs can be adaptable to less sunny situations. So rosemary in the full sun is great, like this one over here, the herb cottage, or the, um, um, the, uh, uh, the golden rain, and then this particular one as well, the Ken Taylor. Here we have another Ken Taylor, though. And this Ken Taylor is growing in half-day shade. A little more open growing, you can see, and so you'd normally come in and prune this plant a little bit more just to keep it nice and thick. But here it's growing in an area that gets shade in the middle of the day, sun in the early morning and sun in the late afternoon. So when we're talking about where we're gonna grow our herbs, in general, our perennial herbs, those herbs that grow from year to year, like rosemary and sage, those herbs generally like full sun. They're all native to the Mediterranean. They love full sun and they love dry conditions, but you can adapt them to more shade. So you notice, unlike earlier when we were talking about basil and parsley and we talked about water, 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 fertilizer, now I'm not even talking about fertilizer at all. You put rosemary in the ground or sage in the ground, and if you fertilized it once a year with a little organics fertilizer or a little fish emulsion, that's generally plenty. And even in a container every couple of months is plenty of fertilizer for rosemary and sage and all of our other perennial Mediterranean herbs. They don't want a lot of fertilizer. If you give them lots of fertilizer, they grow really quickly, they don't get the scent, and they don't develop the flavor. So you really want heavy scented rosemary, heavy scented sage, and that way you develop all the flavor pattern, the flavor to it as well. So this one, Ken Taylor, this one is more of a ornamental. You could use this one for cooking and people are always asking me, can I use all varieties of rosemary for cooking? And in a pinch, the answer is yes. But the upright varieties, Tuscan Blue, Blue Spires, Golden Rain, Herb Cottage, those varieties are upright and they're much better for cooking. All of our semi-trailing and our trailing varieties are generally used for landscaping. And uh, all of our uses for culinary are definitely secondary to those varieties. But you may have a certain um, landscaping use you have and so that's the one you've got. If that's the one you've got, that's the one you use. Again, I mentioned potatoes because when I think of rosemary, I think of potatoes. But you can also use it for chicken, fish, if you use it lightly for fish, um, all kinds of eggs and breads as well. So rosemary is one of those plants that here in California, it's almost a weed, but it's a really useful plant. This plant also, I actually use it in my bath water during the winter. I mentioned it brings uh, blood circulation. So if you are cold in the winter, there's nothing better than a rosemary foot bath or to add a little bit of rosemary leaves to a bath uh, to get your circulation going. Hopefully it'll also help your memory at the same time. It's a wonderful herb. Make sure you include this in your essential garden. Our fourth essential herb for your garden is thyme. Thymus officinalis. Again, there's many different kinds of thyme, but today we're just going to talk about thymes that you would use for cooking, not landscaping or ground cover thymes. So thyme is one of those interesting herbs. Many herbs are long lived. A bay tree will live a thousand years. A rosemary will live 75 years. Thyme is short lived. So thyme only lasts one to two years generally in your garden, and then you're going to replant it. So it's not you that's causing the death and destruction of your time. It's just that it doesn't have a long lifespan. So very different than a lot of other culinary herbs that we grow. They're native to the Mediterranean. 
This one that we're sitting here by right now is golden lemon thyme, and it's one of the most beautiful to use as an edging plant. First of all, it just looks gorgeous. It really brightens up a little area. And second, it tastes and smells like lemon. So this little guy here, the leaves have this wonderful bright lemon flavor. It's wonderful for tea. Again, we don't think of using these common culinary herbs for tea, but lemon thyme tea is delicious and it's a good digestive. So it's another one to include. Um, of course, there's also that lemon thyme martini uh, recipe that you can get offline that's really delicious. So thyme you plant every year or every other year. It's one of those herbs that when I'm giving a talk, I ask people, how many of you grow thyme in your garden? Everybody raises their hand. I say, how many of you use the thyme out of your garden? And maybe 30% of the people raise their hands. So thyme, when in doubt, in the, gar in the kitchen, when in doubt, use thyme. It's kind of one of the basics. It's one of our best herbs for blending. So if you're looking to use a couple of different stronger flavored herbs like oregano and rosemary, if you add thyme to that mix, it blends and mellows other flavors. So a lot of times, instead of seeing thyme as the one single element, you'll find it as part of a group or a mixture of herbs. So a lot of times it's with oregano, basil, marjoram, sometimes bay leaf. It's a wonderful herb to add. A little history behind thyme. Thymus is probably from the, uh, a Greek term to fumigate. So it actually was believed to get rid of a lot of insects in the garden. And people would actually burn this in their homes in the Middle Ages to help keep insects away from your garden, away from your home. So now we keep it in our gardens more, more to bring insects in. We have thymes that will bloom beautifully in the spring. Again, you can eat those flowers just as easily as you can eat the leaves. Um, it's believed that the fairies hang out on the flowers. So it's always good if you wanna bring your garden fairies into the garden. Garden fairies are supposed to keep our gardens nice and clean. So if you want garden fairies in your garden, you have to plant thyme. It's also an herb that's uh, believed since it rests low to the ground compared to many other herbs, that this is where the souls would hang out before they would move on into heaven. So you'll find it planted in a lot of cemeteries, mostly in Europe, but also uh, in here in the United States also, so that when spirits were free of the soil, they would hang out and take a rest on the thyme leaves and then they could move on into heaven. So a lot of really wonderful old history behind thyme. Again, it's short-lived. You're gonna plant it in full sun or when you note things have variegated leaves like this golden lemon thyme, you can actually plant it in part shade. Variegated leaves generally will withstand quite a bit more shade than full green leaves. It works well in a container, or you want to put it towards the front of the garden bed. These only get about 12 inches tall. So if you put it too far back in the garden bed, if the dog doesn't smash it, it will simply get lost behind sages and rosemaries and other culinary herbs that you're going to have in your garden. So thyme, many different selections of thyme. Besides the golden lemon thyme, our most common thyme is English thyme. There's a green leafed English thyme, but my favorite English thyme is English Wedgwood thyme, which has a green and yellow leaf. It's wonderful for cooking. It gets about a foot tall and it's very easy to grow. There's other thymes though that are commonly used that have a little different flavor. French thyme, which is also a thymus vulgaris. French thyme is easy to grow and has a more rounded, a little bit heavier flavor. The leaf is finer and has kind of a little point to it, but it's easy to grow, a little bit stronger flavor. It doesn't bloom quite as heavily. There's a lot of other citrusy flavored thymes. We're growing a ground cover, lemon thyme, which we don't often think of to use for cooking, but when you use it um, in a container, you can let it hang out of the container and sprawl out of the container, and that makes a wonderful culinary thyme. Also, we have an orange thyme, 
We have two different ones. We have spicy orange thyme, which is a ground cover and which um, is really nice to use for drinks, especially adult beverages. It makes a wonderful addition. And then we also have one just called orange thyme, which gets a lot taller and makes a nice kind of a stronger, heavier orange flavor for cooking with. And again, if I was cooking vegetables, especially in the summertime, that orange thyme really brings out a lot of flavor. And that orange thyme is also in full bloom right now, so you can kind of get an idea about where those garden fairies might want to hang out with this many flowers. It's also a really terrific plant to bring in honeybees. So it brings in a lot of bees, so if you're going to use it as something you're going to walk on, keep that in mind because there will be honeybees on it while it's blooming in the spring and early summer. You'll replant it every year or every couple of years, and you're going to keep it fairly dry, just like your other perennial herbs that we talked about. So it doesn't need a lot of water, and in the ground, you'd only fertilize it maybe once or twice during the whole season. In a pot, you'd fertilize it more often. Easy to grow. It's one of those plants that you can change out every couple of years. It's worth growing once people realize that it's one of those herbs that you use all the time for blending and it's also a salt replacement. We're all trying to reduce the amount of salt we use our, in our diet. And one of the main herbs to use as a replacement is thyme. So thyme in all of its forms, English, French, uh, lemon, orange, they all make really wonderful additions to your culinary garden. Our fifth and final essential herb for your garden is oregano. Oregonum vulgare, the common oregano. There are many species and varieties of oregano, and oregano is a flavor, not a single plant. For the purposes of this video, we're only gonna discuss Oregonum vulgare, so our common Mediterranean climate oregano. Even within that, there's many different varieties. Oregano is a little promiscuous, so it tends to cross-pollinate and produce a bunch of new interesting varieties. Today we're going to discuss Greek oregano, Oregonum hirtum, this little low guy right here, very thick and full, beautiful plant. We're going to compare that and contrast that to Italian oregano, more upright, kind of soft, furry leaves, mm. and the very robust and silver-leafed Syrian oregano that has this very silvery leaf, very hairy leaf, just getting ready to bloom. What you see at the tips of those stems are the flower blossoms, not quite open yet. So we've got Oregonum vulgari hirtum. We've got Oregonum vulgari margarana or ex margarana. It's a hybrid between our common oregano and marjoram, and Oregonum syriacum, Syrian oregano. Same uh, genus, very different flavors. So Greek oregano, that low growing, tends to be a bit of a garden thug. You put it in a really nice bed and it starts at one end of it and it goes eight feet across. So it's a very happy plant. It's very spicy. Again, the, normally your oregano is like full sun, but they are adaptable down to part day shade. So this oregano, super hot, really spicy. Yeah, numbs your tongue a little bit. Very different flavor from what I grew up with. So oregano is an ancient plant, but you're not gonna see it in many recipes until the second half of the 20th century namely post-World War II. Most American cooks didn't use oregano until servicemen came back from World War II, especially from Italy or Greece, where they had really experienced the Mediterranean culture and the food, and oregano was introduced then. Woo, spicy and hot on the Greek oregano. Some of us grew up with Italian oregano. So Italian oregano is a little more upright growing, hasn't quite started to produce the flowers yet, but when it produces the flowers, they're kind of a dark green. They're this wonderful edible part. So when you get the flowers of oregano, especially the Italian oregano, they're wonderful for cooking. 
So Italian oregano, oh, much milder, sweeter. So for some types of cooking, the Italian oregano works better. That kind of warm, robust, or warm, robust, yet still sweet flavor. Greek oregano, spicy and fairly hot flavor. So depending what you grew up with, you're gonna recognize it. When you go to buy your oregano plant, it's really great if you can taste that oregano plant. It is definitely a pass along flavor. You remember it from your mother or your grandmother. It's what you grew up with is what you're going to be familiar with. This third one, Syrian oregano. This has become a lot more popular in the last few years. So we do a lot more ethnic cooking. So here, just coming into bloom, again, you can eat those blooms when they start to open up. The leaves are almost succulent-like. They're really, notice that sheen to it? That's actually all of those little hairs on it. So oregano is always fairly drought tolerant. This one's extremely drought tolerant. You could do this in a rock garden or a garden bed that only got watered as little as once a month. Syrian oregano, oh my gosh, super spicy, really spicy. This particular oregano is often called za'atar. So za'atar is a Middle Eastern herb or blend of herbs that always includes an oregano or something similar to an oregano. It's always super spicy. I'm still dealing with a numb tongue here from eating it. So if you're looking for something with a lot of punch to it, if you're looking to do Mid-Eastern cuisine, this is a nice choice. The plant is gonna get about two feet tall again, easy to grow, very easy to grow. They are all tend to be evergreen shrubs. So particularly the Syrian and the Italian oregano, those two oreganos are perfect to put in a bed where you can cook from them and you can harvest from them all the time. Our Greek oregano tends to die back in the winter time. Hardy perennial and yet it still dies all the way back to the ground. So a lot of people like to include more than one oregano in their garden bed because you get a much different flavor from the oregano and also some of the oreganos like the Greek oregano you can't harvest fresh during the winter time. They're super hardy. They can go under a snow load. Um, you'd want to grow them where they're going to get excellent drainage and they're going to be dry. The other nice thing about oregano is it's antiseptic, antibacterial, antimicrobial. If I'm going to rub my feet with any essential oil or take a foot bath with any of these herbs, it's going to be oregano because those are the ones that, this is the herb that really gets in there takes care of all kinds of things like colds and coughs and allergies and all kinds of problems. So it's a wonderful herb to add to foot baths. Remember, it's going to be really spicy, especially if you're using the Greek or the Syrian oregano. So if you're using this in your bath water, use it sparingly or uh, you will know right away when it gets into your pores. Very easy to grow though. Put it in a bad soil rather than a good soil because if it's in a good soil, it's a garden thug and it will take over that bed. So we've discussed all five of our essential herbs for the garden. They're parsley, which is our biennial that's gonna get quite a bit of water and you need to plant every year. Sage, rosemary, thyme, and oregano, all sturdy perennials that will live at least one year in the garden if it's thyme or up to 25 years in the garden if it's rosemary. All easy to grow all useful in all types of gardens, regardless of where you live, whether it's a container or whether it's in your garden beds or a raised bed. Next week, we're going to discuss herb gardening in containers and raised beds. How to grow your herbs in an area where maybe you don't have much soil, maybe you're just growing on a little windowsill or on a patio or a deck. We're gonna learn all about growing our herbs in containers and raised beds. For more information, you can visit my website, morningcenterfarm.com. Thanks for watching.